I'm Mindy Stearns. We are live at 5. To know him is to love him. He's a CEO, entrepreneur, outlier, overcomer, father, brother, and underdog. I'm talking about my husband, Glenn Stearns. You are live at 5 on Grit. Grit Happens. All right. Oh, my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is very exciting. Um, This kind of just all... Just is, I'm I'm really excited. I'm kind of having so an out of I. world, out of body experience. I, I, I'm having an out of this universe, so, universe, out of this world experience. Okay, so this is ex- okay. So you know this podcast this universe, has to do with grit happen, developing grit and and a success and an entrepreneurial already many entrepreneurial aspects. But one of the greatest accomplish- accomplishments I think we have as a nation, one of the most incredible feats we had, was landing on the moon. That's right. And on this day, in 1972, this exact day, we landed on the moon. And today, we have that astronaut who was in the lunar module, who actually walked on the moon. He was the youngest astronaut to put foot foot on the moon's surface. Can I please welcome Brigadier General Charlie Duke? Welcome! Welcome, Charlie. Woo-hoo. Good to see you all. There he is. There he is. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us in your home with Dottie there, your lovely wife. You know, we've been friends for some time. We met, gosh, I want to say. How long, Charlie? Um, 12 years ago. We, Because when I was pregnant, you came to our uh, Life Changing Lives event. That was when we first met you, I think, or around, oh, around 10 years. Oh, we were hunting buddies, yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we about, met earlier hunting, Glenn. Yeah. Glenn yeah. Probably about 15 years ago. That's first time I met with y'all in Newport was, uh, uh, I don't know. 10, 15 years, 15 years ago, I guess. Yeah, it's been We've a while. had some fun. We have had some fun with this incredible couple. Let's talk about today, though. This is an this is a historic moment. So, and I want to just before we go there, I want to just say a couple things. One is, you know, again, Charlie, the, you know, I I did a little show myself last year and had a lot of people that have asked, um, kind of, how do you do that and. You know, what, what does it take to start your own company or, you know, get yourself out of a funk or change your trajectory of your life? And, uh, you know, I said, well, um, you know, I might as well just do a podcast because I have so many people that have been asking me these things. And I'm going to bring some of my good friends who have also figured out how to set a goal, reach a goal, go way beyond their goals and to, in you know, really better their lives right and when that happens a lot of those times it doesn't go exactly the way we plan it it doesn't go and it and and it is not a straight line right there's a lot of things that happen in in that trajectory that takes us uh places we never dreamed of going and so you know you are i'm so excited to have you on because you are one of those that you know you're story is large right and then you can relate to the people that are just trying to go get a job promotion or just trying to start a new company it's all the same kind of things it's just you've done it in a in the biggest way imaginable you know well that's true and you're right it's not a straight line uh when i was 17 years old and uh graduating from high school uh i had no idea that i was going to land on the moon like <laughs> term astronaut wasn't even invented we've never <laughs> launched a satellite in this in the space i graduated high school in 1953 and uh i went to the i did have a goal though the goal was to get to the naval academy which i did get to the naval academy and then uh, i fell in love with airplanes at the naval academy so i said well, God, i gotta go fly airplanes <laughs> not sail ships and so uh the Uh, I had a choice between the Air Force flying and the Navy flying. And I, uh, I was undecided until the doctor said to me on my senior year at the Naval Academy, he said, Mitch, I'm a Duke. Uh, You got astigmatism in your right eye and you don't qualify for Naval aviation, but the Air Force will take you. So, uh, and, uh, and so that was another little detour. And when I got to the, uh, I got to the uh, Air Force and the flight school. Uh, I had soloed in first part of October 1957 when 
the next day, the day after my birthday on the 4th of October, uh, Sputnik. Reagan Allen. Uh, stuck, uh, Sputnik. Is that Sputnik? <laughs> Is Sputnik talking to you right now? <laughs> uh, 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 Sputnik uh, uh, launched. Launched. And so I, then a couple of years later, they selected astronauts. And I was now a flight pilot in Germany. And, uh, and so uh, I said, well, I'm too young, too inexperienced. But I, I was focused on my career. I had a great job. I wanted to be the best pilot I could be. And uh, I kept my antennas up. Uh, what, is the, what is the possibility? What's on the radar? Though I couldn't be an astronaut, maybe I could get to school or something like that. So in 62, uh, the Air Force sent me back to uh, uh, graduate school at MIT uh, and for a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics. And that was another detour. I had to leave a great job over in the, uh, over at Germany as a fighter pilot. But I look back now, if I hadn't have said goodbye to that job and gone to MIT, I would have never made it to the moon. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy, Choices along the way. By the way, I don't even know how to spell MIT, okay? That's, <laughs> I could not get close <laughs> to that college. Well, oh. I hardly did either. Man, I was on probation uh, for the first year, and the uh, Air Force was about to send me packing, but uh, I pleaded with them, and they gave me another <laughs> chance. And uh, anyway, while I was there, I, I worked on the Apollo guidance and navigation system on my master's thesis and met some astronauts. And I'd never met anybody so excited about a job as these guys. And I said, well, how do I do that job? And they said, uh, you need to uh, go to test pilot school. So I applied for test pilot school, another detour. Instead of being an engineer, now I'm back in flying. And, uh, and so I graduated from there in 65. And the very next month in September of 65, I read an article in the LA Times that said NASA's seeking more astronauts, please apply. And I said, that's wow. for me. Was that so, a classified ad? Astronauts yeah. wanted? <laughs> <laughs> Can I take you backwards, though? There's, you, you missed one point that I think is pretty important. At least um, I find it an amazing um, Path? Tw tw trivial pursuit question. So you were involved in the the um, astronaut program in '63, right? In late '63. Well, not in the astronaut program, but I, MIT had the contract to build the Apollo guidance and navigation system, and so I was doing a master's thesis in that area. So I said, "Can I work on this system to for my master's thesis?" They said, "That's a great idea. We need a pilot." input into this thing so and when so when neil Armstrong landed on the moon in in 69 he landed on the oh moon. 69 i'm sorry we're back okay i was thinking 63 that's 63 when you were born when, honey uh, that was not as significant <laughs> as a moon landing I was thinking, although i'd like you'd like to think it was when kennedy said <laughs> that we're gonna go to the moon right or that's when he died in 63 go ahead sorry Brain. but it was then it was to me uh a focus perseverance hard work and and just taking a, advantage of that little inner voice you have inside said this is the way to go and uh so that's why i tell everybody these kids today keep your antennas up you never know what what your career is going to end up and so in 66 i uh, uh Dottie and i went to uh houston with our little son charles and uh we we've been in texas ever since 10 years as an astronaut and fortunately, I got uh, uh, very fortunate to have been selected to be one of the moonwalkers. Of the 12 of us, uh, I was number 10. And as you already said, I was the youngest, but that's no big deal. Uh, There's only 12 of you in, in the, the world, world that have touched that surface. That is a pretty rare space that so, you're standing in. But I in. do. I go back to 1969. I'm sorry. You're right. I was, I was off on another zone. I was on my head. I remember exactly <laughs> watching the moon landing, and I said, this is the very first one, I mean, and I, I wanted my mom and dad to know that I will remember the moon landing as I was watching it on my head. But w do you played a part in that? What was that? 
I did. Uh, I had been a, a CAPCOM, which is an acronym for Capsule Communicator. It's the astronaut that's in mission control that actually does the talking back and forth to the crew. Uh, and uh, I had done that job on Apollo 11, I mean, Apollo 10, which went to the moon, but did not have a, uh, a landing on the moon. And so Neil Armstrong asked me to come over and do the same thing for them two months later. And so I was the Capcom for Apollo 11 and our shift or our team was the guys and, that were on duty during the landing, the activation checkout of the lunar module and the landing. So if you listen to that decent recording, uh, that Southern accent that you hear, uh, Mission Control was me. <laughs> you said you, you got say? a what lot you... of us turning blue, didn't you? Something uh, like that. And it was a really uh, a, 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 a story of the what Mission Control does. They're the unsung heroes of Apollo. They saved the day on Apollo 11. They saved the day on Apollo 13. They saved the day on Apollo 10. They saved our landing on Apollo uh, 16. So without those guys in mission control, um, we would have been dead in the water on a lot of missions and, and we would have had a fatality with Apollo 13. So I gave him big credit. I learned a lot uh, of the teamwork uh, that's required between the crew and mission control and also the teamwork that's required uh, on, on a crew. Uh, John Young and I were, uh, ended up just best friends and uh, uh, like uh, brothers actually. And uh, we could just tell one another what everybody was, they, each other was thinking. And we had fun uh, in training and we were decided we we're gonna have fun uh, on the moon, which we did. So, so tell me this. So speaking of what you were thinking, what were you thinking when you're <laughs> sitting on the end of this, this bomb basically that is going up, shaking and going you know, up through the atmosphere? What are you, what's in your mind really at that moment? Well, as you get in the spacecraft and you're probably strapped in an hour and a half before liftoff, they close the hatch. Uh, you're sitting there monitoring your systems and your thoughts are going, let's count. Keep counting. Please keep counting. I got to fly this thing. I'm ready to go. Please keep counting. And so everybody was just hoping and praying. I wasn't praying, but that in those days, but I was hoping that this thing was going to get off on schedule. We had about a four hour launch window. And if you didn't get on in that four hours, you delayed 30 days. Oh my gosh, anticipation. In that 30 days, you could have an airplane accident, a car accident, break a leg, get bitten by a snake out there in Florida. <laughs> I mean, or an alligator. <laughs> I mean, we had, in our training area, we had some big rattlesnakes. Let oh, me tell you. God. And uh, anyway, uh, that's why everybody wanted to go. We trained for two years for this, for this opportunity. So it's please counting. It wasn't any fear, uh, wasn't any anxiety. It was just keep going. And sure enough, right on schedule, right on the second, wow. uh, that ignition sequence start and then lift off. Oh. And then I got to admit, I got a little, uh, not frightened, but a little nervous. Why is this thing shaking so oh much? Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. Uh, and uh, it was a vibration from side to side. And uh, uh, later on, I, we were all instrumented for heartbeat and respiration. And I found out later from the flight surgeon that was on duty at that point said, uh, when I asked him, what was my heartbeat? He said, you're really excited. It was 144. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you're in a, you're heading to the moon. Yeah, I mean, we, I feel that way when I'm in a, like a ride at well, Disneyland. Well, <laughs> Did you ask what the other two heartbeat was? I did. I, I don't remember Mattingly, but John Young, the commander who was on Apollo 10, his was 70. Oh, so you can what? <laughs> oh, wow. Smooth and uh, calm. The cool one was. Cool. But it shook, us, it shook for three minutes, uh, two minutes and 40 seconds till the first stage burnout. And then we had this big train wreck uh, as it dropped off the first stage. And then it started again, and from then on, as smooth as glass. And 
we got in orbit about 100 miles up and circled the Earth one and a half times. I mean... Fired the third stage, and we were on our way to the moon. That Who gets to say that? Wow. I'm sorry. So few. And, you know, that shaking, I think, you know, you see so many films and um, cinema depicting those moments of rocket ships. Do you think, is there any one film, any one that got it the most right of all the films you've seen? Is Who who got it best? Is there a film that you well, recommend is the best depiction of those experiences? I can't uh, see all the, I don't There's remember so many. I don't have seen all the films, I should say. But I think the ones I have seen were uh, with uh, Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks. Oh. And, uh, and that scene at liftoff was, if I recall, was pretty accurate. <laughs> so, uh, and and now you can get the. Uh, we didn't have the cameras on in uh, inside the spacecraft at, at the point of liftoff, so uh, there is no inside to see it. But if you look at the liftoff of the space shuttle, they had cameras, and you see this vibration. But theirs was this way, very rapid. I was more of a Side by side vibration, pretty, pretty big amplitude. You could feel the the shaking, and it got your attention really. Wow! So now you're in space, and you're you've slung shot, I guess you call it, or something like that, around the Earth a couple times to get your trajectory right to hit the moon, um, and you're headed towards the moon. How long are you there, waiting to hit the moon? Well, it was uh, Apollo was a 72 hour trip to the moon. Uh, and so we entered orbit about three days later. And then we orbited the moon for a day. And uh, then John and I activated the lunar module. I think this would have been the fifth, uh, fourth day of the mission. And uh, we uh, started our descent. Uh, after a six hour delay, by the way, we had a major problem one hour before landing with the uh, command ship that was to stay in orbit. And he had to change his orbit, which required a major burn with the main engine. And uh, unfortunately, there was something wrong with the control system, one of the control systems that put us in a no go situation. And that meant if we couldn't fit, if mission control couldn't figure it out we were no go for our landing so that was the biggest moment of disappointment oh. on the mission but six hours late it took mission control about four hours but uh, to figure it out but they gave us a go for landing so six hours behind the schedule we started our descent now how much computer power did they have back then well our apollo computer <coughs> excuse me our apollo computer had 80k memory 80k 80K. They don't make a smartphone in the world with 80K anymore. No, I think what you give is such a, a strong example when you go speak to kids and you go to schools and you tell them that cell phone right there that you have, <laughs> what has more power in it than we had in an entire building of computers to land on the moon. I think that's a very powerful visual as to how far we've come. Uh, well, my phone has 64 gig of memory, <laughs> and that's 800,000 times of the <laughs> Apollo computer. Wow. Oh, that's God, so crazy. that's just like you wrap your brain around that and just imagine like just. OK, so now you're got... coming down and you're yeah. landing on the moon. Right. And you're going to land. Are you again? Is your heart did, is it hitting the 144 beats again or how are you feeling? I think we we're a little bit more calm on the descent. Uh, that was uh, we were a lot busier. Uh, so you're more focused on the. Uh, uh, on the activity and your procedures rather than just riding along and and feeling this the vibration yeah. so what do you feel when you land well you it's like a helicopter it, it, the last hundred feet john had picked out a, a a spot and i'm talking him down with altitude rate of descent and we had a profile that we had to maintain to get on the ground we had plenty of fuel and so he had selected a good spot. I'm talking him down, ma managing the systems if we had a problem, looking outside occasionally to see if he's not landing in a big rock on my side. And uh, then at, at about six feet off the moon, there's one of the probes turns on a light, hits the moon and turns on a little light and the said contact. And when that light comes on, 
uh, I said, contact engine stop. And John stopped the engine and we fell in the last five feet or so. And when we hit, it was like, whoo, like that, but real solid. It didn't bounce. It was just, it just gave this big whoo. And you're standing up. So you're uh, strapped to the floor, but standing up. And so you use your knees as a shock absorber. So when it hit, you just sort of squatted down a little bit and came back up. And then we both erupted with enthusiasm. Yeah. Excitement. You know, old Orion is finally here, Houston. Fantastic. Oh. So I have a few things that I want to get to because I think they're important lessons for people at home. But there's yeah. so much of your story that's so interesting that uh, I hope, you know, we'll, we'll extend this out a little bit. But um, before we get there, now you're on the moon and yeah. you've decided you're going to go for the world record long jump. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit about that? And Could this be a story about taking risks? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, at the end of our stay, now this is three days later after we'd landed, we were all finished up, done all of our geology and all of our experiments. And uh, John and I decided to do the moon Olympics. And the two uh, Why not, right? <laughs> events we were going to do with a high jump and a broad jump. Oh, and no. We start with a high jump, but mission control was pressing us and says, you guys get back in. So John, but John stops to starts to bounce up and down. And when he started to bounce, I started to bounce. And when I got this big push to get up, I straightened up. And when I did, my center of gravity went over behind me and I went over backwards. And that was the only time of fear that I had in a, in a mission. Cause if that, I land on that backpack too hard, and it breaks, I'm dead like that. Yeah. And so I, I said, do something. And I roll right, well, I thought do something, not said it, but I thought something, I rolled right and was able to break my fall. And on, I was now flat on my back and my heart's pounding. And John comes running over and says, uh, that wasn't very smart, Charlie. And I said, I know, help me up. And I realized I was okay. And wow. uh, so at that point, uh, mission control was very upset. <laughs> I can't uh, imagine a long distance slap that was in order. <laughs> so we canceled the long jump and no more moon Olympics guys. No. And so I, I think I there's video of that somewhere. Isn't there video online? You can catch that video of you yeah. doing the, yeah. the lunar Olympics. A, in fact, all the EVAs, so the ones when we stop and turn on the cameras is all on the, the web now. It's all it, over. It, yeah. <laughs> Glenn, the lesson learned was, Never practice, never do anything in space that you haven't practiced. <laughs> in a pool. <laughs> in a pool or somewhere. That's right. Uh, so um, before we move on to a couple other things, now, what is it like down there? Is it a desert? Do you feel like, you know, are, is you, are, what, are, what does it feel like? And then what is your mind like? Are you thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm the 10th? Were you the 10th at the time person yeah. to walk on the moon? Yeah. What did you see? Like, what's the first thing you remember seeing when you stepped off? Was it uh, a horizon, uh, the moon, the, what, what, the land, the, the dirt? A lot of craters, uh, mountains off in the distance. Uh, Buzz Aldrin described it as magnificent desolation, which it was, but it was incredibly beautiful. Uh, strangely, I felt right at home, though. I did not feel like an alien in a foreign land because... You could look out left, right, and you could see the landmarks that we had studied in the photographs, and you could see Stone Mountain, and you could see the uh, craters to, in the horizon, and it was beautiful to me, uh, very barren, of course, and very, very covered with very, very fine dust, like powder, and mostly gray in color. Wow. And, uh, it was exciting. I was, I, I was excited. I was in awe. I was uh, wonder uh, and uh, feeling of adventure. All of those things, emotions rolled into one, and that never left for 71 hours and 15 minutes on the moon. Didn't wow. you say you looked across and you saw on the horizon, was it the earth on the horizon? Is that how that, how that went? Is that? Actually, the earth, where we landed was in this, as you view the earth, moon from the earth, we were, uh, we were in the center of the moon. So that puts the earth directly overhead from where oh, we I were. See. And you could look at, we could look out though and see the horizon, 
and it was very sharp, distinct between the lunar, the gray lunar horizon and the blackness of space. Ugh. We were on the moon. It was always daylight. 72 hours on the moon. It was always wow. daylight. So the sun so, never sets on the moon. You had also <laughs> said something earlier. You said oh, that yeah. you were, you know, when it was go when the rocket was leaving, he goes, it, 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 you were, everybody was doing everything, praying, everything. You go, well, I wasn't praying at the time, right? And now, yeah. then, now you're on the moon or you're in the capsule and you look down and uh, you, you told me something once about that blackness of space. And do you mind repeating that? Yeah, you you just see this blackness of space, and there is no uh, there are no stars visible because the sun is shining all the time. And uh, I I can remember uh, that uh, in orbit, as we orbited the moon, I could hold out my hand, and underneath my hand was the Earth. Oh. And I had this experience uh, of the the beauty. Uh, of the, the the universe, if you will, especially the Earth. I wasn't a, a I, I was in church, uh, but I wasn't a Christian, and uh, at that point, but seven, six years later, uh, in uh, seventy eight, I had an encounter uh, with Jesus, and I became a believer, and uh, and that oneness that I had of of all of us on space here first became alive to me. And I realized we're all down here and God loves every one of us. And, uh, and so I'm to love everyone. So as God loved us, we're to love one another. Uh, the second greatest commandment, Jesus says. And so now Dottie and I travel around the world as part of our uh, time uh, with our ministry and sharing our story about how God changed our life, changed our marriage, uh, changed our family, uh, and gave us a peace and a purpose uh, after the moon. Wow. Amen uh, to that. Walking now, walking on the moon lasted three days, but walking with Jesus is forever. I wow. think that's beautiful. And I, I think that goes to just to fill in the blanks that, you know, we've talked about this before. You, you, you reached the pinnacle of the most incredible feat a person could imagine. You've walked on the moon and then you come home and then. Where do you go from there? And I know you struggled with that's, a lot that's right. to yeah, get to that place. Exactly my next question. Yeah, because you you come home, you're celebrated, you've walked on the moon, and now you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> now yeah, what? How's that go? We all had that. It, now what I do? I'm 36 years old. Now I'm 37 years old, and uh, I, and it, all of a sudden, it, you know, what are you going to do? A lot of guys uh, left and went into some into politics, some into business. I decided to go into business instead of staying on uh, at NASA. So in 76, I left and opened a, a beer distributorship, actually, in San Antonio. It was very successful financially, but it just wasn't my career. And so I decided to sell that business and go do something else, uh, which uh, and the very next month is when I became a believer in April 78. And since that time, I've now after businesses and investments and stuff like that, I'm a motivational speaker, uh, uh, just telling this story to kids and adults and like like you do your story, uh, Glenn, uh, and with grit and, <laughs> and steadfastness and uh, focus, uh, you can you can accomplish yeah. it. And it so I do that. And then, uh, of course, Dottie and I do our ministry uh, you, you know, I, I think that's that's amazing. What a lot of people at home need to understand is, you know, sometimes we set our goals too low. Sometimes we set them too high, right? And yeah. But what happens when you set a goal that is out of this world <laughs> and you hit it, right? And then you come home. To, a lot of us are lost for a while and things happen to where you've got to then understand that you've got to, recalibrate you've got to then change again the way you know it, and to mindy's point and your point it's hard um once you know you go okay i've got it everything i ever asked for and then you go but am i happy right and you ended up saying you know what i needed was way beyond my own self-gratification i needed to find something much bigger than that and you did which obviously sent you to a place that has put a lot of joy in your 
lives and um, yeah, your purpose, life and everybody else. Great purpose. purpose. Sharing yeah, that message with no others. About that. And uh, we've got a full life now. And uh, at uh, 84 uh, years old, uh, we're traveling the world. We spent, uh, uh, I got uh, just on Delta Airlines, eight round trips to the moon. <laughs> You know, I I think something that you also say that has stuck with me in your stories is the one about you. Was it that you believed in God or you look back and at the image of the the, the planet hanging in space in the blackness? You have this picture of the globe in your mind. You just said that. Oh, you did? Did I? You were busy with the. Oh, I heard him talking about the blackness. (laughs) I've just but I just that one. I think that picture. I think we showed the picture, but it was just. It has stayed with me because right now there's so much concern for this planet and there's a real consciousness about planet preservation. Are you, um, like, do you just look at this planet and, 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 and does, do you get on board with that? Let's take care of this place. Where's your, where do you feel in that, in that uh, journey? I'm, I'm not a, a big global warming fan. Mm-hmm. I think that you look at the history of our planet and it's, uh, cycles up and down the sun has a lot of effect on uh on the uh temperature uh co2 is a uh, it's not a poisonous gas without co2 we wouldn't be alive because all of the plants breathe co2 all of the trees breathe co2 and out of that comes oxygen and as we get a little bit warmer uh then i see longer growing seasons uh, more food for the seven billion people on board, and what I see is a is a wise stewardship of the resources that God's is, God has given us, and uh, that's where my focus is: is to be a good steward. Uh, and uh, I, I God has given us uh, basically the earth to live, and we need to take care of it, but we also need to utilize the resources that God has given us. And That's right. Looking at our technologies uh, that we're developing now, the resources are going to, long, uh, going to last a lot longer than we expected. So, so, so I have a story. Uh, I'm, optimistic. I'm optimistic about uh, our future. I like and, that. Uh, I like I like. there's a quote just before you tell this next okay. story. I think I know where you're going to go, but there's a quote that if you're too comfortable, it's time to move on. Terrified of what's next? Well, you're on the right track. And I think that summarizes a, a lot of the stages throughout life where you sit in discomfort and terror, like okay. what's next, but that is the right track. And God put you on that plane and that journey. Yeah. So Charlie, I, I want to tell you, um, I remember there was a time and I'm, I'm wondering if at any time during that whole journey, you pinched yourself and said, I can't believe I'm here. But I, I remember a time when I pinched myself. <laughs> I was <laughs> sitting in Fiji. Okay? This might be top secret. It probably is, but that's okay. And I'm going to let a lot of people down in the in the world with this story. I'm sorry. Um, who are believers. But anyway. Oh, no. I was sitting in Fiji on a lounge chair, and it was night. And there was the full moon above me. And on my left was the vice president of the United States. And on the right was General Charlie Duke. <laughs> okay. Do you remember this, Charlie? Do you remember and this we, moment? I think there was a little wine served, so Maybe. I thought I had some truth serum in the two of you. And I said to you both, now that you've had a few glasses of wine, <laughs> I want to know the truth. Is there, are there aliens that have come and visited the, the earth, or do you know of any? And then at the time... You both looked at me and said, <sighs> Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> There's no longer, this podcast is no longer airing. <laughs> but I got your truth out of it, or at least what you knew at the time. And uh, needless to say, you know, I didn't get anything out of either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that might be. That's funny. So are you going to invest in alien UFO space travel, Glenn? Glenn? <laughs> Not anytime <laughs> soon, but uh, that was that was a. I think there's a big future in space tourism, and uh, yes, one hundred percent. Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and Blue Origin and all of those. 
uh, I think we'll get it uh, get it down so a lot of people would be able to go. Yeah. I, I want to look at the moon the way you look. I mean, the earth the way you looked at the earth. I want to look back and look at that. Incre- I mean, we may not get that far in space, but what an image. It's the most beautiful jewel you can imagine just in the blackness of space. And there it is, just blue and white and green and brown. brown. Oh, so, what a gift. Black. So, Charlie, you are you're up in the capsule. And um, and you are there doing some some different uh, experiments. And wasn't there a point where you guys like have to, you know, you have you're going to wash up and stuff and you put things like your rings in space and stuff. Wasn't there a little story with that? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. On the second day out, uh, uh, we didn't have any showers on board Apollo. So to clean up, you just. uh, uh, took your flight suit off and everything like that, and just took a wet towel and 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 uh, and wet wet yourself down. Well, Ken Manningly, after he'd done that, uh, he was uh, getting dressed again, and and his wedding ring that he'd taken off uh, had floated out of this pack a pouch pouch I should say pouch in the side of the spacecraft. That was the second day, and. Uh, Two days later, we get to the moon, uh, we orbit the moon, we land on the moon, we come back, and uh, now a week later, and he's still looking for his wedding ring. <laughs> oh, not... How do you where, tell your wife? Honey, I left it on the left moon. Left it on the moon. <laughs> yeah. and, and so uh, we're coming home, and on, I think it's the ninth day of the mission, we have a spacewalk on the way home. So uh, Mattingly gets out and goes to the back of the spacecraft. I get out and tending his lifelines and stuff. And it's gorgeous. The earth is off to the right, 180,000 miles away. Anyway, I get back inside to make this story short. And uh, I'm looking at him. He's now 10 feet away on the, working on a biological experiment with his back to me. And all of a sudden from the bottom of the spacecraft, I look over and there's his wedding ring floating out the door. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) And uh, I reach for it and I miss it. But it was it, the only uh, relative velocity was just a, 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 a few feet per 30 seconds or so. And it was floating out and it eventually, eventually hit him on the back of the head. <laughs> which he did not feel in his spacesuit. And instead of bouncing off into space. Which it ran- could have been because it's a round surface on a round surface. I mean, the chances. Right. The chances of taking a 180 degree bounce is infinitesimal. <laughs> he back towards me, towards the hatch, eventually floated back into the hatch right in front of my face, and I grabbed <laughs> <laughs> Marriage saved. <laughs> that is the greatest story. Oh. Charlie, you are such a national treasure. We, you really are. You and Dottie, I'm so glad we've uh, got to be friends with the both of you and hear these incredible stories and we're so blessed to have this time with you today on this incredible um, anniversary of um, the moon landing. And we just your are... Your moon landing. Yeah, your moon, your moon landing. I mean, there's not very many of all the men who have walked on the moon. Right. And, uh, and for those out there, really, I mean, that you are a testament of, of reaching for the moon, of literally going for a goal that's so audacious and something that is so out there... And that you're it. that you're going to you know that you can achieve anything and so you know I think for those listening when you've got a big goal don't be afraid to say it don't be afraid to stand up and say I'm going to go you know <laughs> to do the moon or Mars or whatever you're going to do in life and and go for it you know and so I really really we we've been dear friends we've gone all over the world and done a lot of things together and we 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 love you guys. And we're really proud to to call you a friend. And uh, again, it's all about really living life and going for it the best you can. And you guys have done that in spades. Well, thank you very much, Glenn and Mindy. We really love you guys. And so thank you for the opportunity to be on this podcast. We wish you all the best. Thank you. And hopefully... uh, once this uh, six feet distance is off, <laughs> we can hug one another again. That's right. I look forward to sharing a hug with the both of you. Thank you, Charlie, for joining right. us on Grit Happens. You can catch us on Apple and uh, Spotify and many others. So we'll we'll catch you next time. Be well, be safe, stay healthy. This is Grit Happens. <laughs>
Love you, Charlie. Bye, Daddy. Love you too. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>